Good morning and welcome to the City of Toronto's 186th COVID-19 media briefing. First up, we have Mayor Tory. Please go ahead. Well, good morning. Uh, more than 4.28 million vaccine doses have now been administered in the City of Toronto. I'm proud to announce today that more than 70% of adults in Toronto are fully vaccinated. Team Toronto is continuing to make real progress. More than 80% of all eligible Toronto residents age 12 and up have now had at least their first dose of COVID-19 vaccine. That number is important. We know that the province will remain in step three for at least 21 days and until 80% of the eligible population aged 12 and over has received one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. So we have now met that vaccination requirement. And we're on track in the coming days to achieve the second part of the criteria, 75% of the 12 and up population having received their second dose. Thank you to everyone who continues to step forward to get their shots, first and second, and thank you to everyone working on these efforts across the city, literally thousands of people helping us out with that. We will not stop until every single resident in Toronto who wants their vaccine gets their vaccine. That is why we have our home stretch vaccine push in the Taylor Massey neighborhood in the city's east end this weekend with nine micro-targeted pop-up clinics. These clinic locations have been strategically chosen as they're all in areas that are frequented heavily by the local community, for example, grocery stores, shopping plazas, and schools. Like we've done in the past, these clinics will offer entertainment and giveaways throughout the day to make it a better experience for everyone. The city's VaxTO campaign will also provide outreach support with calls to almost 20,000 people with trusted local doctors, for example, delivering the message to get vaccinated to the people who have yet to take advantage of that opportunity. As with all of the home stretch vaccine push initiatives, the aim of these pop-up clinics is to connect with the neighborhood residents on the ground in their communities at locations that they're comfortable with and that they frequent in order to help remove any remaining barriers to access to vaccines. This two-day initiative, which will be open to all residents from M postal codes with a focus on those living in M4B and M4C, will be supported by local community partners and extensive community ambassador-led multilingual canvassing. I want to thank the Michael Guerin Hospital and East End uh, Toronto Health Partners and numerous local community agencies for their work thus far in bringing this push for this weekend to life. I encourage all local residents to drop by any of the clinics most convenient to them over the course of this coming weekend. The work to deliver second doses to our homebound residents is also continuing successfully. Our homebound sprint is expected to finish delivering second doses this long weekend. Our homebound sprint team, including Toronto paramedic services and hospital partners, delivered approximately 8,000 first dose uh, vaccines to people who are homebound. That same team has now been going about the careful work of delivering second doses throughout the month of July. More than 7,100 second doses have been delivered, that's around 91%, and the remaining doses are expected to be delivered by the August long weekend coming up. I want to thank again all the members of Team Toronto who have devoted themselves to the homebound program and to make sure that we get vaccinations made available to our homebound residents. Our tremendous progress on vaccinations will allow the city to further expand our mobile teams toward the end of August. Chief Pegg and Dr. Davila will outline today the city's plans to ramp up our mobile vaccination efforts even more so that we can increase access to those who have yet to get their first or their second shots. As clinic turnout diminishes, and this is a natural thing that occurs, this will mean the shifting of hundreds of staff from some of our city-run immunization vaccine clinics towards mobile efforts that will reach people who still need their vaccine, reach them in their neighborhoods. Instead of expecting that they will come to us, we will go to them with the vaccines. This will continue to be a massive effort to reach people who we know need to reach uh, so that residents in all areas of the city can put this pan pandemic behind them by way of vaccination. At the same time, our work on reopening, which has been helped by the strong turnout for vaccines, is going strong. I'm happy to announce that beginning on Monday, August the 9th, just over a week from now, the City of Toronto will begin a safe and gradual reopening of our city buildings. This will be done in a responsible and coordinated manner with the health and safety of residents, businesses and city staff remaining our top priority. 
That is why we will continue to make all decisions based on public health guidelines. We will begin by reopening City Hall, North York Civic Centre, Scarborough Civic Centre, Etobicoke Civic Centre, York Civic Centre and East York Civic Centre for a phased reopening of select in-person counter services such as construction permits and tree permit applications. These buildings will be open for in-person services from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. However, hours of operation for counter services will vary. Our website will have details for each service and building and for all of the hours of operation. To ensure the safety of staff and visitors, we have installed sanitization stations throughout the buildings and protective plexiglass barriers at all counters, as well as increased cleaning protocols. This is in addition to mandatory masks or face coverings indoors and two meters of physical distancing at all times, as well as visitor screening at all sites. Online services will continue to be available because they make sense and we know people have enjoyed using them and just as we've benefited from implementing new ones during the course of the pandemic. As part of the city's ongoing modernization over the course of the pandemic, city staff continued to implement many digital improvements to city services, including complete digitization of the film permit system, a portal for development applications and a fully digital water services system. I know it's been a long and challenging process, and so I'm thrilled to be able to announce the news today that we're beginning the resumption of city services uh, in the buildings where people are accustomed to uh, visiting from time to time. We're excited to open our doors again and to welcome visitors and guests into our buildings in a safe manner. I'll have more to say on a further reopening of city facilities in August. I hope this inspires other businesses to do the same in a safe and responsible manner so that we can help Toronto return to a more active and thriving city. And I'm having a meeting today uh, with major employers in the city to discuss their plans uh, to uh, have people safely return to work and what that will mean for the downtown and for other parts of the city as well. I'm also excited to announce a new restaurant program called Dine Together. Dine Together will support the recovery of local restaurants and celebrate Toronto's diverse culinary scene. As you know, the restaurant sector was among those hardest hit by the pandemic. As you know, uh, Toronto's food and hospitality industry is a very important one to us, employing as it does thousands and thousands of people and being a big contributor to life, economic life, and generally life in all parts of the city, including downtown and on our main streets. And so now uh, we're going to have this program to show support and help them get back on their feet in the restaurant and hospitality business. The two-week program will run from September 17th to October 3rd and will showcase Toronto's restaurants and encourage residents to check out local eateries through a feature menu available by takeout, delivery, patio dining and or indoor dining. Participating restaurants will offer one or, two, uh, one or more two-course feature menus for lunch and or dinner consisting of a main dish, either an appetizer or dessert. Restaurant operators will also be able to choose the price of their feature menus from a range of $15 to $50 in $5 increments. Think of it as an updated and reinvented winterlicious or summerlicious type of program, but the bottom line is the same, which is to show support for our restaurant and hospitality business after a period in which they have been very hard hit. So I, peep, I hope people will take full advantage of the opportunity to register for this program. There is no participation fee and minimal eligibility criteria, and they're all set out at toronto.ca slash showlovedo. Online registration for this program, Dine Together, will open at 9 o'clock in the morning on August the 4th and will close on August the 31st. This is what Toronto is all about, a world-class food scene with people who are prepared to support it in any way possible. And so I want to thank our partner, Destination Toronto, which is the tourism development organization that does such a great job promoting Toronto to people here and people outside of the city and the founding sponsor American Express for their work in bringing this program to life at this time uh, in the month of September. And thank you as well to the Government of Canada's Federal Economic Development Agency for Southern Ontario which is called FedDev Ontario for their support of Show Love TO and Dine Together. They have stepped forward as a government to support this because they know it is very important to the overall economic well-being of Toronto and to us having a successful restart uh, for our economy as we go forward. As you know, this is our 186th scheduled COVID-19 media update. Thanks to decreasing case counts and increased vaccination rates, we're able to move away from a regularly scheduled update and we'll report more on an as-needed basis. And we certainly will be quite prepared to come and report and be held to account uh, as uh, circumstances uh, dictate. 
We will continue to update residents when we have big news to share. We have found this uh, channel to use to communicate with people extremely important to us and extremely valuable to us. And uh, we have found the accountability to be very useful as well as I hope that the members of the media and the members of the public have. And we're quite prepared uh, to be here answering questions on pandemic related matters on a go forward basis. But this is a good thing. It means that we're in a good place as a city uh, in terms of our numbers, whether it's case counts or vaccine uptake, with lots of work left to be done, as we have been discussing. These briefings have been made possible with the key help of some very key people that I want to take the opportunity to thank uh, today. First of all, all of our briefings have featured ASL uh, and deaf interpretation. And I will apologize personally to that group uh, today because I know I speak quickly and they have expressed to me sometimes their very friendly frustration, but nonetheless frustration with that. There has been a rotating group of people who have helped us with this and maybe they're rotating out of frustration, but uh, for the past several months, our interpreters have been Sarah and Glenda from the Canadian Hearing Services and I wanna thank them personally on behalf of everybody who watches who will benefit from their work and has benefited from their work. I also wanna thank all of our great team at uh, Strategic Communications, uh, Toronto Public Health, the Office of Emergency Management, Technology Services, Facil uh, Facilities Management, as the people who have been primarily responsible for helping us to stage uh, and, and put on these media updates through the 186. All of the city staff as well who made themselves available to answer questions on the line, and that was particularly necessary at times of complicated developments taking place on all different uh, parts of this. And to our dedicated AV team who made the technology work, uh, Markham, Mike, Craig, Nick, Paul, and Ferdinand, uh, thank you to them as well. We couldn't have put these on without their help. Uh, Brad Ross, uh, who has been the voice behind, and much more than that, uh, these media avails and moderating these discussions, I wanna express a, a very heartfelt thanks to him. And uh, while um, I don't have occasion, or perhaps take the occasion to do this often, really, uh, we owe very sincere thanks to the media. It's impossible in a pandemic like this where people are thirsting and hungering for information for us to do that without your support. Um, and obviously you chose to uh, examine as well you should uh, the information that we conveyed here at this table and to ask questions to probe uh, us uh, as well you should again, but uh, you were an indispensable channel for us to get information to the public that they vitally needed to keep themselves healthy, to comply with public health guidelines, to understand what was often very difficult to understand in the context of how to get vaccinated and all kinds of things like that. This was literally life-saving information you helped us to share with the public. And finally, um, the uh, group that appeared most frequently in front of you were Chief Pegg, uh, Dr. Davila, uh, Councillor Cressy, and myself. And I wanna thank uh, Chief Pegg, Dr. Davila, and Councillor Cressy. I don't think any of us thought uh, two years ago, I don't know how you possibly could have thought we would ever be sitting here tasked uh, with the responsibility of not just leading the city through a global pandemic, but the incredible amount of communication that was required uh, in order to keep people informed and to help them stay healthy and to save lives. And I am very appreciative that people, professionals like this, and I've spoken often about their professionalism, have been sitting here uh, with me, uh, and that includes uh, Councillor Cressy, who isn't here today. They continue to do great work for the city, uh, and that is true of every single member of our Toronto Public Service as well. It's extraordinary the things that have been done, the services that have been maintained, the services that have been delivered to people during the pandemic under the very capable, uh, steady leadership of our city manager, Chris Murray. The work isn't done yet, uh, and the fact that we're not gonna have regularly scheduled avails doesn't mean there isn't much more to be done on the pandemic, and we will continue to do that work with our public service colleagues as we continue with a safe reopening and as we continue to fight uh, COVID-19 to the ground. So again, thank you to everyone involved, and of course, most of all, the public for their understanding. There were times when it was difficult for us to explain what we were trying to explain uh, because there was some degree of uh, inconsistency at times between what one municipality or another were doing and this kind of thing, but people were very patient uh, with us. So now it's time to ask Chief Pegg to uh, make his remarks for today. Thank you, Mayor Tory, and good morning. In 2020, our immunization task force began planning for the eventual arrival of COVID-19 vaccines long before vaccines had ever been approved for use in Canada. The province originally asked us to be ready to commence vaccine clinic operations in the city of Toronto on April 1st of 2021. I remember well taking a call from General Rick Hillier on New Year's Day 2021 when he asked if we could be ready to stand up the first proof of concept vaccine clinic before the end of January. 
He also asked if our team would agree to develop and author the playbook for mass COVID-19 immunization clinic operations in Ontario and to validate that playbook in our first proof of concept clinic. At 1.30 in the afternoon on New Year's Day, our COVID-19 strategic command team convened and our immunization task force went to work the same day. On January 18th, two and a half months early, we opened the first proof of concept vaccine clinic in the Metro Toronto Convention Center and administered the very first doses of COVID-19 by the City of Toronto. The Provincial Mass Immunization Clinic playbook was completed and validated as requested, setting the stage for vaccine clinic operations across Ontario. Since that time, the City has worked non-stop to administer more than a million doses of COVID-19 vaccine in our city-operated mass immunization clinics. Each and every day, as part of the network of Team Toronto vaccine clinics, we continue to administer thousands of doses of COVID-19 vaccine across our city. To date, more than 4.2 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine have, made, have been administered in Toronto as part of our Team Toronto initiative. This is a huge accomplishment when you consider that even a year ago, COVID-19 vaccines didn't even exist. I'm extremely proud and thankful for all the city and Toronto public health staff, along with our Team Toronto partners, whose hard work and dedication have contributed to the success of these clinics and in the achievement of this significant milestone in our COVID-19 response. As Mayor Tory announced, we are now able to progress into the next phase of Toronto's COVID-19 vaccination program. Shortly, we will begin to scale down a number of our city-operated vaccine clinics. In order to enable an increased focus on hyper-local mobile vaccine team deployments, we are already hard at work planning the myriad of logistics required to make this happen in an organized and efficient manner. Following the completion of scheduled clinic operations on Sunday, August 22nd, we will close five of the nine city-operated mass immunization clinics, including Carmine Stefano Community Centre, Malvern Community Centre, Mitchell Field Arena, North Toronto Memorial Community Centre, and the Toronto Congress Centre. The remaining four city-operated mass vaccine clinics will remain operational until further notice. This includes our clinics located in the Cloverdale Mall, the Metro Toronto Convention Centre, the Scarborough Town Centre, and at the Hangar. Since Monday of this week, all first dose vaccinations administered in city operated clinics have been by walk in only. Second dose appointments can be booked in advance through the provincial booking system as well as by walk in. All nine city operated vaccine clinics are offering walk-in vaccinations for anyone 12 years of age or older who require either their first or second dose of COVID-19 vaccine. Our clinics are open to walk-ins every day from noon through 7 p.m. Clients who receive their first dose of COVID-19 vaccine in a city-operated mass immunization clinic in August will be informed of their options on how to access and receive their second dose of COVID-19 vaccine. We will continue to do all we can to support every Toronto resident in receiving their first and second dose of vaccine as very soon as possible. Our nine city operated mass vaccine clinics will continue to operate seven days per week across Toronto between today and Sunday, August 22. I strongly encourage everyone who has not yet been fully vaccinated against COVID-19 to get vaccinated without delay. In order to best protect yourself and those around you from this deadly virus and the highly contagious Delta variant. There are thousands of doses of vaccine available each day in our clinics and across the network of Team Toronto vaccine clinics. Anyone who requires a second dose of COVID-19 vaccine can book a confirmed appointment in any of the nine city operated vaccine clinics until August 22nd and the remaining four clinics thereafter. Vaccine appointments can be booked either online via toronto.ca slash COVID-19 or by phone at 1-833-943-3900.
Finally, I'm pleased to report that our COVID-19 Demobilization and Recovery Command Team is already up and running, with numerous initiatives and planning operations both underway and on track. We are leading the development and implementation of comprehensive plans, ensuring that effective and responsive systems are in place as we transition into the post-pandemic phase of city operations. Our team is also hard at work supporting and coordinating the citywide post-COVID-19 recovery and restart efforts in support of both city operations as well as in support of our business partners across Toronto. We will continue to work alongside the city's senior and corporate leadership teams to drive the completion of these objectives as we put COVID-19 behind us once and for all. As has been the case since we first implemented our COVID-19 incident management system, we continue to ensure that we have responsive, nimble, and scalable plans in place should the situation change moving forward. We are ready and able to again escalate our response operations should the need arise. In closing, I would like to acknowledge and thank the thousands of people who have and continue to go above and beyond the call of duty each day in service to our city. And finally, I would like to thank our media partners for being our connection to more than 3 million people at what has now been 186 of these COVID-19 press conferences, along with every Toronto resident and business owner for enduring and absorbing so much, for listening to and following our advice, and for making the effort to get vaccinated. It is as a result of your collective efforts that we are winning the battle against this pandemic, and I, for one, I'm deeply appreciative. Thank you. I now invite Dr. Davila to provide her report. Thank you, Chief, and good morning. If I may, I would just like to take a moment to echo the Mayor and the Chief uh, with a small note of personal thanks myself to all those who played a role in supporting us through these press briefings and especially to the people of Toronto. Owing to our earlier start today, I am presenting the COVID-19 metrics we issued for Tuesday when we had 29 new cases of COVID-19. 25 people were in the hospital, three in the ICU. And as well, I'm sorry to say that there have been three more deaths in Toronto due to COVID-19. As the mayor and the chief have said, Toronto is entering the next phase of its COVID-19 vaccination program. In this next phase of the vaccination campaign, we are building on our mobile successes and redeploying resources to increase our hyper-local mobile clinic opportunities in focused areas with lower vaccine uptake. As of August the 23rd, we will have five times the number of mobile clinic teams in operation than are currently administering vaccines across the city. This will allow us to bring vaccines directly into workplaces and into communities and organizations who are experiencing low vaccine uptake. The most important thing to remember about the changes to city-run immunization clinics is that if you want a first or a second dose, we will be delivering them. Our approach is changing a little, but our commitment to making vaccine available to you stays the same. City-led opportunities are in addition to the hundreds of pharmacies, healthcare sector partners, and primary care providers who are now delivering COVID-19 vaccines. Our most recent data shows that there are approximately 350,000 Torontonians who are eligible for their second dose of vaccine. They may have had a scheduling conflict or perhaps they've forgotten their second appointment. Some people may be nervous about their second dose, having heard stories about side effects from family or friends or they may think that one dose is sufficient protection against the virus. Whatever the reason, and I can't stress this enough, 
a second dose is critical for your protection. Toronto Public Health and our partners are doing everything we can to spread this message. Calling, texting, and emailing all who are eligible for their second dose to get their vaccine as soon as possible. I also want to speak briefly today to people worried about reports of breakthrough infections, the rare cases in which a person gets infected by COVID-19 after being fully vaccinated. There's not much more to add to what doctors and scientists are already saying, so I will make three key points. First, and most importantly, breakthrough infections are not common. We hear about them a lot because they are unusual. The second is to remember a person with breakthrough infection almost never gets seriously sick. When they do, there's often other health problems involved. And third, the vaccines are still on the job. They are safe and they work. We've said from the beginning, the vaccines protect us against serious illness, hospitalization, and death. Breakthrough infections are typically mild because the vaccines are at work. Through vaccination, we've gained a great deal. We want to protect that by completing second doses or getting a first. And it is vital to get vaccinated because it's well known that the Delta variant is more infectious than any COVID-19 variant we've seen during this pandemic. It is infecting the unvaccinated with an ease that worries me as a doctor. So if you aren't vaccinated, I worry about you. I also think a lot about children under 12 who at this point can't get vaccinated. That opportunity will probably emerge in the coming months once we have sufficient data that we can assure parents this is the right thing to do. In the meantime, the best way to protect children under 12 is for everyone who's over 12 to get vaccinated. So if you've decided to watch from the sidelines for a while, you can derive confidence by looking at all the people around you who got their vaccinations months ago and who aren't sick, but are protected. Here in Canada, we are so lucky to have access to vaccines like we do. There are hundreds of millions of people around the world who would trade places with us in an instant. Having questions about your own health care is totally normal. If you have questions you need answered before you can decide to get vaccinated, I'm only going to ask you this. Find a trustworthy expert and talk with them. Get your questions answered. You can call your doctor or a community health care clinic. You can call 311 or the Toronto Public Health Hotline. It's okay if you have questions. And here's the best news. There are good answers, good science, good data, and good people who you can trust to tell you the truth about why it's safe to roll up your sleeve and join the hundreds of thousands of people who are safely vaccinated feeling well, and know that they're protected from COVID-19. With that, I'll now hand it over to Don to moderate the questions. Thank you, Mayor Tory, Chief Peg, and Dr. Davila. We'll now open it up to questions from the media. As a reminder, it's one question, one follow-up. We will unmute you when it's your turn. We also have staff on the line if you have any specific and technical questions. First up, we have Lena Latifat 
from CP24. Good morning, and thanks so much for taking my call. Uh, my question is for Dr. Eileen Davila. Some powerful numbers out of Peel this morning. We're hearing from Dr. Lawrence Lowe, who says between June 1st and July 9th, 100% of Peel residents hospitalized with COVID were either partially vaccinated or not vaccinated. Uh, Two-thirds were unvaccinated. I want to ask you, what do these stats say to you, and is it a similar story in this city in Toronto? So thank you, Lena, for the question. I don't have the specific numbers in front of me, but certainly this is, uh, you know, what you're talking about in Peel is certainly being echoed all around the world where vaccine is, is accessible and is being administered. We know that uh, vaccine offers really strong protection. It is um, the best uh, protection that we have available to us, of course, in concert with, uh, you know, practicing good public health measures as we have throughout the course of the pandemic. So I would encourage people, as I have through my remarks this morning, that, you know, please go out and get vaccinated. Take comfort in knowing that so many of us are fully protected with vaccines on board. This is the way forward in respect of uh, getting our lives back and, and restoring, uh, you know, life more like it was before there was such a thing as COVID-19 in our midst. Um, it is perfectly normal for people to have questions about their health care, including about vaccines. Please go talk to a trustworthy expert. Get your questions answered. I'm sure that when you hear the data, when you hear the science and you hear the rationale, and the strength of the science behind vaccines, I'm confident that people will go out and pursue this course of action. Follow up. And I want to talk to you about uh, back to school safety. We know students will be heading back to the classrooms in just a few weeks. So should vaccines be mandatory for education workers? Where do you stand on that? And should students in Toronto prepare to wear masks inside the classroom? So, you know, Lena, I think you ask excellent questions, and these are subjects that are under active discussion, as I'm sure you can well imagine at this point in time. We've heard from our provincial counterparts who have purview over education that they are soon to release a plan. I can tell you that local public health units are in active conversation, certainly amongst ourselves and with our provincial partners, and we're looking forward to hearing uh, more about what our provincial counterparts have in mind. Uh, I would say this, uh, again, lots of strong evidence in respect of vaccine. And as I mentioned in my remarks today, the best way we can protect our community is for all of us who are eligible to receive vaccine right now to get vaccinated. Uh, I mentioned about how I have uh, concerns and I think about uh, those members of our community who are under 12 years of age and therefore right now not eligible to receive vaccine. That's something that uh, I expect will change in the coming months. But in the meantime, the best thing we can do to protect them and to protect our entire community is for those of us who can get vaccinated to get vaccinated as soon as possible, get that first dose, then get that second dose to give you the, you know, the best benefit that the vaccines can provide. That's what will help reduce transmission within our community and therefore best protect our children and their ability to return to school, which we know is so, so important. Um, so we'll look forward to hearing what the provincial plan uh, on education has uh, to articulate. And in the meantime, I would just encourage people to get vaccinated as soon as they possibly can. Next up, we have David Ryder from the Toronto Star. Hi there, thanks for taking my question. Um, New York City has announced that it's going to require more than 300,000 civic employees to get vaccinated by September 13th or they will be subject to weekly tests. That comes uh, a week after New York also passed the vaccine mandate for all healthcare workers at city-run hospitals and clinics. Is Toronto looking at any kind of requirement for vaccine uh, for city workers of any stripe, or, or if they don't get the vaccine to have some kind of test? Well, I'll start, and Dr. Devilla may wish to add, uh, we obviously uh, are going to uh, uh, abide by public health advice with respect to what the best thing is and the safest thing uh, is for us to do to keep uh, our employees safe, but also, of course, to keep the members of the public safe and others who have interaction with uh, public servants. 
Uh, those are discussions that are under uh, active consideration by us in terms of uh, if you were to have such a policy, who would it apply to and how would it apply. And I can just say to you that uh, you know, we're not at, at the moment uh, ready to come forward with uh, where we end up on that. And, uh, but it is something that is under very active discussion at this moment in time. And uh, it's one of the reasons as well why uh, we're seeking any guidance that we can get uh, from uh, the province in particular, simply because I believe and have believed throughout the pandemic that the more we can have policies that are consistent as between municipalities and consistent across the region, indeed across the province, uh, the better it's going to be for everybody to understand uh, what those policies are, how it keeps them safe, and uh, so on. Uh, so uh, I, we will have more to say about that as we reach a resolution with respect to, um, to uh, what, where we ultimately end up. I think the only thing I would add to that which the mayor has already said is that uh, you know this notion of mandates sounds simple. It is, of course, far more complicated than it might seem at first blush. There are certainly legal considerations, occupational health considerations over and above uh, that which uh, concerns public health. But in the meantime, I, I think that we continue to really encourage people to make, peop make it as easy as possible to get access to vaccine uh, because, again, we're really very much focused on uh, increasing coverage, vaccination coverage throughout the city. Um, and of course, we're interested in doing that which is informed by the science that not only improves coverage in terms of vaccination rates, but also improves confidence in vaccines uh, and the benefits and protection that they provide. So those are front and center uh, in our minds as we continue with the discussions that the mayor spoke of. Follow up, Dave. Yeah, just following on that is, uh, I guess, for, for, for Mayor Tory and Dr. Devil, if she wants to win, is so far Premier Ford seems to be treating um, vaccination mandates of any kind as kind of like a third rail that, that he will not touch. And uh, yesterday he just sort of pointed his, his finger at, at the feds um, who are, you know, probably poised for an election and have other things on their mind. So uh, one of my colleagues today compared it to, to sort of like ask your father, the, the city is saying talk to the province, the province is saying talk to the feds, and meanwhile nothing that we can see substantially is going to happen. So my question I guess for Mayor Tory is if the province continues to not want to touch this issue, can the city do anything on its own? It did it with mask mandates after saying it, it couldn't. Uh, is what, what, what happens if the province refuses to move on this? Well. I think we're in a position, obviously, with respect to the people who work with us uh, for the City of Toronto to take some action in that regard. But I've said, uh, you know, that it is preferable within the context of all these legal, employment, uh, health, and other uh, considerations for us to have consistent policies that apply uh, across the region, if not across the province. And so I had a discussion uh, with the Premier about this yesterday, and uh, he understands my position on it is simply that I think the more we can be consistent with one another, the more we can give guidance to the different constituencies out there apart from our own employees, the better off we're all going to be in avoiding a confusing or chaotic situation, say, come the fall when many more people are going to be going back to school and back to work and coming back to city halls and places like that. So, um, you know, we would do what we could do uh, if, if uh, it, with respect to our own employees, for example, subject to the outcome of these discussions that both Dr. Devilla and I have referred to, uh, but I, I think it is certainly going to be, I think, a better situation for us all if we have uh, an overall game plan that applies, uh, generally speaking, uh, to uh, institutions, businesses, and others right across the province, which is why I think uh, an early sit-down to have a discussion about that would be very helpful, uh, because I just think the main thing we have to do here is keep people safe, but also to avoid confusion that we've seen at other times when it's kind of every person, every business, every school board, every hospital, every city for themselves. I think it just creates uh, you know, more confusion uh, than might be desirable. Dr. DeVille? Nothing much further to add to what the mayor said. Um, I think he's quite right. Clearly, we want to avoid any kind of confusion. And I think, uh, David, in your question, you imply that, uh, you know, we've had some experience in the past. Certainly, we're trying to learn from all the lessons um, and the experiences that we've had over the course of the pandemic to ensure that we're able to provide a, a clear and consistent message that's easy for people to follow. Uh, that is in keeping with the science and ultimately gets us to increase vaccination coverage. As we know, it's the best protection that's offered uh, against COVID-19 and in particular against the Delta variant. And at the same time, 
we want to make sure that whatever actions we're taking um, you know, here at the city, whether it's on our own or in partnership with others, including the province, uh, not only increase vaccine coverage, but also increase confidence in vaccine as, as a very uh, beneficial intervention that's available to all of us in light of COVID-19. Next up, we have Sean Leithong from CTV News. Good morning, and thank you for taking my call today. Um, first question for Dr. Davila. Uh, we heard yesterday from the federal health minister that uh, the feds are working with all the provinces to produce a immunization record for anybody who may be traveling and uh, going to a country who would require proof of vaccination. But we also know the provinces said they don't want to have any sort of vaccine passport. I want to know, Dr. Davila, what is your, where do you stand on this as we start opening up on uh, on the idea of an immunization record uh, for for people in the province? Well, I think, Sean, on a very practical level, it uh, certainly appears that having some mechanism by which to verify your vaccination status will be important um, to such things as international travel. So, so clearly, um, if that's the case, we're going to have to have some kind of verifiable method uh, of um, ascertaining vaccination status, which is why I imagine the feds in the province or provinces, I should say, are working on, on uh, some kind of immunization record. Um, so I think that uh, if for no other reason than that, um, this is something that uh, should progress uh, and uh, I think will be of benefit. I think people also, just like with all other immunizations, like to have a record of that which they've already undertaken um, in terms of vaccine. So again, there are a number of personal benefits and clearly some related to travel and, and the kinds of activities that I think people are going to want to engage in uh, over time um, that will be uh, supported by having such an immunization record in place. Could I just add a word to that? Um, the fact is that in Ontario, uh, you get an email when you have your, uh, your vaccine. Uh, you also have uh, a written uh, piece of paper that you're handed on the way out. And furthermore, you can go online and get a copy of the uh, documentation that says that you've, been, uh, you've received a vaccination. And so the challenge only becomes one of making sure that when you're looking at what other countries or our own country requires, because our own country requires you to show the double vaccination to come back in without quarantining, that the documentation from the Ontario government is easily available to people, which would appear to be, and that it has the right information on it. And so a lot of this gets sort of boiled up into a tempest in a teapot by philosophical and political uh, considerations that people are having debates about, which is fine. But the real core of this is that there is information available. It's quite easily available. Some people already have it. And the only question is, will that be satisfactory to satisfy the needs, say, of other countries or of our own country when you're coming back in, or for that matter, other people who may ask for this proof if people want to get it. And so that's really, I think, what has to be sorted out. Follow up, Sean. Uh, yes, uh, you mentioned breakthrough infections, Dr. Davila, earlier on, and we have seen uh, some of that in the United States. I know the CDC in the United States has changed their advice when it comes to uh, wearing masks indoors, advising people to once again put masks on in COVID-19 hotspots. Um, where do you stand on mask mandates as we go into the fall? And some have said they expect numbers to increase, even though we have high vaccination rates. So, uh, Sean, here in the city of Toronto, as you may know, we have had uh, an indoor um, mask uh, policy or bylaw uh, in place since last year. And that continues to be in place, uh, given what we understand of COVID-19 transmission. So, um, you know, as we continue to learn about Delta variant and its increased transmissibility, there's certainly clear benefit to uh, using all the layers of protection that are available to us. Vaccination is clearly a very important one, but as is the case for every single vaccine, it is excellent protection, but there is no such thing as 100% protection. So by using the combination of vaccination in concert with other public health measures, uh, transmission reducing measures, protective measures, like wearing a mask, like staying home when you're sick, like uh, keeping distance, particularly when you're in an in indoor setting and you don't know 
what the vaccination status of other people is, um, or if you have particular health concerns. Doing all these measures together um, constitutes the best protection that we can undertake ourselves for our own personal health and for those around us. So I would encourage people to continue to follow those good practices. And of course, if you have not yet, yet gotten vaccinated or if you haven't gotten that second dose, I would encourage you to go and pursue that at your earliest possible opportunity. And finally, we have Morgan Campbell from Global News. Go ahead, Morgan. Thanks for taking my question. I just wanted to touch on the next phase of this vaccination program. Um, you had mentioned that um, you're building on mobile successes. Maybe this question is best served for uh, Chief Pegg. Um, and uh, going hyper-local in focus areas with lower vaccination rates. Can you paint a bit of a picture as to what that's going to look like? And Dr. Davila, can you follow up with, you know, why we believe um, we are seeing those lower vaccination rates? Thanks, Morgan. I'll, I'll start and then uh, Dr. Davila can certainly um, carry on from there. So we, as you know, we have operated uh, mobile vaccine teams uh, for a considerable amount of time. Um, well in for, for many many months uh, shortly after we act we we initiated our uh, immunization clinic operations we actually initiated mobile as well so the the notion or the operation of mobile clinic operations is not new uh, in the evolution that we are embarking upon now which of course is something we're doing in response to the ever-changing uh, COVID-19 landscape and in accordance with the best advice coming from Dr. Davila and the public health team we are we're, we're going to redeploy and transition some resources so that uh, Dr. Deville actually said in her remarks, we're going to increase the number of mobile teams that we can deploy by five times as many. That allows us to be very nimble and very responsive uh, as uh, the public health team is, is analyzing literally on a day-to-day -day basis, looking at vaccine coverage rates and infection rates and uh, the myriad of data that, that is analyzed on a daily basis across the city. So allows the city to be increasingly nimble, uh, allows us to bring vaccine to people instead of course relying upon uh, what has been the mainstay or the backbone, if you will, throughout our response to date, which is having people come to clinics. So uh, five times more, uh, more mobile team capabilities, which is great. Uh, that of course still remains hand in glove with all of the Team Toronto partners. That includes hospitals and Ontario health teams, uh, hospitals, pharmacies, primary care physicians, and uh, so many others across the city. So uh, really just taking us into an increasingly flexible, increasingly nimble environment. Dr. Davila? Yeah, thanks, Chief. Uh, if I can add to that and address some of the other elements of the question, you know, we've heard from our community partners and from community members themselves who have not yet taken up the opportunity to get vaccinated that there are a number of barriers in place. Uh, and you know, so far our mass immunization clinics have served as well and our current vaccine opportunities ha have gotten us to this point uh, in our vaccination campaign where we have over 80% of those eligible who have uh, at least one dose on board um, and uh, getting second doses up to, uh, you know, the target level, you know, now sitting at about 70% uh, or just under. So we know that we've had some success to date, but we also know that in order to uh, continue to get vaccine coverage up in those areas and in those populations in the city where we need to see more coverage, uh, we actually have to bring the vaccines to them, uh, exactly as the chief said. And we have to manage uh, some of the very legitimate questions that people have in respect of vaccination. Unfortunately, there is some misinformation around vaccines that continues to circulate, and this may have some influence on um, people and, and the decisions that they're making in respect of their health. We know that a number of people in our community, unfortunately, have not always had the best experiences with healthcare, and this may figure into their decision-making process as well. So we're trying to make these interactions, clinic experiences, as positive as they can be to demonstrate that healthcare can be a positive experience. A and I think the other, um, or the final point I will make is that for some people, there are very practical considerations or concerns um, that frankly just make it difficult to put vaccination at the top of their to-do list. 
uh, we know that there are a number of people in our community who are working multiple jobs um, and who have just um, a variety of, of challenges that they're managing through on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so, uh, unfortunately, getting to a vaccination clinic may not be at the top of their list. So the idea is to reduce barriers as much as possible, to bring vaccine to people where they live or where they work, uh, to answer questions, to provide them with the information that they need so that they can make the right decision to protect themselves and to protect those around them. Mayor Tory. Just to offer an example of the benefits of these community ambassadors we uh, put in place a long time ago, um, they have been going door to door in some of these under vaccinated neighborhoods and literally knocking on the doors as a means of encouraging people to get vaccinated, but at the same time engaging in a, uh, a dialogue with people about why they haven't and been vaccinated and to really confirm what's been said. People are actually telling us, yes, some have a degree of hesitancy. Uh, that relates to sometimes their experiences with the healthcare system or things they've heard about vaccinations generally. Uh, some people will say, well, yes, I have an appointment booked for a second dose, but it's later on, and they didn't realize uh, they could book an earlier appointment or get it done uh, earlier. And others uh, still uh, express concerns, as Dr. Davila said, about things like time off work, so that we have, uh, as has been said, remedied that in the two principal ways that we can. First, uh, to have these thousands of phone calls made, for example, by trusted local doctors who will talk to people about why they should get vaccinated and it will be coming from somebody that they have a relationship with, including our community ambassadors. And secondly, taking the vaccines to the people as opposed to the previous model, which wasn't exclusively that they had to come to a clinic, but it was based on, on that significantly. And now we're going to be saying we'll put much more effort, as the chief said, five times as much uh, in the way of resource being able to go to take vaccines to the people. But it's based on a lot of intelligence we pick up from the fact that we have people, hundreds of people, going door to door in these under vaccinated neighborhoods, finding out from people what it is that's keeping them from getting vaccinated. And I think we'll be able to overcome that just with these increased resources and with the continuous effort. It gets harder and harder the, as you get the numbers up and up, and the numbers are going well. And Morgan, your follow-up? Yes, thank you. Um, and I just want to kind of build off what Lena kicked the meeting off with, or, or the question period off with, rather. Um, with the situation we're seeing unfolding in Peel, um, and the fact that Toronto has 350,000 people eligible for their second dose, um, how important, Dr. Davila, is it to, to get ahead of this and to contact? those individuals and, 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 you know, encourage them to get vaccinated. And if people aren't getting vaccinated, could we, um, if those individuals aren't, could we see something similar to what's uh, occurring in Peel? So, uh, you know, Morgan, I think uh, we are exactly trying to avoid any kind of uh, negative situation associated with uh, suboptimal vaccine coverage or suboptimal vaccine uptake. So as you heard me mention in, in uh, you know, my remarks this morning, we are using every channel of communication available to us, including uh, you know, a press briefing like this, but over and above, specifically calling the individuals who we know um, need that second dose and are eligible to receive that second dose. Of course, at the same time, we are actively working on encouraging those who have yet to receive a first dose to start their course on vaccination and to start their journey towards being fully protected by vaccine against COVID-19. These are efforts that we're undertaking each and every day. We will continue to do this and we will do everything in our power to make sure that uh, people who um, are eligible for their second dose or afforded opportunities to get that second dose as soon as possible um, and as well we are taking every opportunity we can through the use of community ambassadors and door-to-door -door, um, you know, communications, exactly as the mayor said. Our primary care physicians are also uh, being enlisted to support uh, very specific uh, and focused communications with those who have not yet uh, fully taken advantage of vaccine. Uh, the protective benefit is there. It is well documented. There's good science and good data behind this. And it is truly the best thing that each and every one of us can do to protect ourselves and our community, get vaccinated. I just can't say that enough. Okay. 
Thank you, everyone. As mentioned, this is our last scheduled COVID-19 media briefing. Moving forward, we will schedule these on an as-needed basis. Have a great rest of your week and a good long weekend.